Good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Swain. I want to welcome you to the APSCO Question Time Live, where I will be finding out from our legal advisor and also our legal counsel actually at APSCO and two of our members what on earth is going on during lockdown and how they're planning to come out the other side. It's Tuesday the 26th of May today. APSCO were quoted only this morning in the Telegraph with a survey that we ran um, that's actually been released only this morning to all members on the, uh, in the bulletin and therefore now on our website, looking at what recruitment companies are doing with regard to office space and what their plans are as they come out of lockdown. That's something I'm sure that we will get some response from our panel and see exactly what they're doing. What I would say is, if you want to put questions forward, please do. If you go to the chat part of Zoom, you can put some questions and we will endeavor to answer all of your questions before 12 o'clock. Don't wait till five to 12 and then worry why we've run out of time to get to your specific question. If there's a burning issue, just go for it. Let me introduce my panel. I'm going to start uh, with Tanya Bowers, who most of you will know. She does these question times live with me every week and has been in the recruitment market for a very long period of time. Um, Tanya has twice meet, uh, weekly meetings, obviously virtual ones, with the Employment Agency, Agency Standards Authority, working obviously with Bayes. She's also working with HMRC to help us shape the legislation that's been coming out to help our members and indeed the recruitment market. And I will be going to Tonya to answer any of the legislational kind of questions that you might have. I also have Chris Short. Chris is the CEO of Concept Resourcing. That's a tech engineering kind of recruitment company um, based in, maybe I suppose one would say the West Midlands, if you look at Dudley, Milton Keynes. He's got about 60 staff. I know a number of those at the moment are furloughed in the same way as a lot of you out there have furloughed staff, and indeed APSCO have a few as well. Um, they turn over about 18 million pounds with about 700 contractors out, mainly, I suppose, in the private, uh, the public sector and some then again in the private sector. Again, looking at IT sales and um, perhaps the supply chain and procurement environments. Thank you, Chris. I, I'm really grateful for you giving us your time this morning. Let me also come to Zoe Lewis. Zoe Lewis is the MD of Method. She spent about 20 years in the recruitment market. Methods is a five office setup, actually six, I think, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield and London. Um, we're turning over about £42 million, mainly from a contract point of view, again, in that public sector. And yes, yeah, having, again, the same as all of us, an interesting time with those customers trying to apply some rate pressure. I'm very grateful, Zoe, to, for you to be there. And also, Zoe, you've just been elected to be on the APSCO Representative Committee and, of course, had your first committee meeting uh, on Zoom, obviously, only last week. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Uh, for giving us again your time this morning. Okay, let me ask you, Zoe, and then I'm going to come to you, Chris. How are you finding business during the COVID crisis? Challenging. Um, naturally, there has been a reduction in the amount of opportunity coming uh, through the door, uh, the number of requirements. Uh, that said, there still is a steady trickle and flow. I think we're in the very fortunate position. We've been around for 30 years methods uh, and we have the recruitment part, which you quite rightly says around about 40 million of the company's 100 million turnover. And then the rest of the business is the consultancy side. Um, so we feed into that as well. So I think, yes, um, it has been challenging. It's been quieter than we'd like it, especially on our private sector permanent side, but the public sector contract side is, is bearing its own at the moment. Um, okay, good. Chris, can I come to you? Just tell me how are concept resourcing doing at this moment in time? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's tough. And we uh, putting things into context. We've got just under 40 staff furloughed. So that's 65-70% um, of our business. Uh, that's mainly our perm recruiters in the business and some back office functions. Um, so four main areas of our business very briefly technology contract. 
that is holding up. Uh, we do quite a bit in the public sector. So central government has seen some strong demand. So that's a growing part of our business. We have a what we call a field projects business, which is supplying high volume um, IT field engineers. Uh, that has been tough, but fortunately we do some stuff with the supermarkets, maintaining the tills. So that has uh, maintained itself. Tech perm is very slow with only pockets of business out there. And tech sales, we've seen some more movement recently. And in fact, the positive news is we've brought in back in two consultants from furlough last week to focus on some retained projects that we've won. So it, it's, it's mixed. Um, uh, I think there's, there's, there are signs of improvement with job flow over the last couple of weeks, but uh, it's certainly challenging. Yeah. Are you finding the public sector, Chris, are playing hardball with regard to negotiation of contracts? We, we have not had that issue yet. I hear others have. Um, the central government um, uh, organisations we're working with, there's been no discussions around uh, rates. We're supplying through, um, through central frameworks anyway. So uh, as far as I'm aware, and uh, yeah, we've had no um, conversations around reduction in margins. Zoe, you were nodding your head. Is it something that you are methods finding that the public sector are playing a bit more hardball? Very much so. I mean, there's an expectation now in, in any bids that we submit. And again, obviously, we're on all the enabling frameworks. Uh, but the expectation from the client is if somebody is working from home, then there'll be a reduction in their day rate, uh, anywhere between sort of 30 to 100 pounds uh, at the moment. Um, and there's even expectations for, for people when they go back uh, into the working office environment, that there'll be reduced rates as well. So yes, there's definitely rate increases around at the moment. How are they justifying that? How are they asking for it and really expecting to have something come back to them on that front? Well, in, in the bids, they're explicitly asking uh, for revised rates for, for those working from home. Uh, and they're explicitly stating what they expect those revised rates to be. And how are the contractors that your team are having to deal with, how are they taking that? Um, Luckily, uh, we've got very good relationships with our associates working for us. Um, I think at the moment, uh, people understand the environment and they'd rather be in a job on a slightly reduced uh, day rate than in, in a market which is not, not the best and healthiest. So that they're being flexible as well, obviously, as are we to a degree, yes. Do you think that uh, the rates will increase once people are back to offices or do you think this is just a way of, of getting us to drop our trousers really and finding them hard to pull them back up? I think in terms of the, the new normal, um, the expectation will be people will work from home a lot more, whether it's our, our staff or, or our associates contractors. Um, so I think even moving forward that um, rate uh, reduction will be there. Okay, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Or, or maybe that those contractors will go to the private sector where there doesn't seem to be that push? Quite, quite possibly, but again, I think there's the, the worry and the issues around the IR35 as well. So it's, it's difficult to say, um, but just watch this space, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating, isn't it? Um, Chris, let me come to you. How did you manage this beginning of the crisis? You know, so you're looking at sort of toward the end of March, people going home, lockdown happening. What were the things that you did for the business and the decisions that you made quickly? Uh, well, the two main things, and I mean, it was cost reduction. That was the focus. So um, we, uh, in fact, I personally carried out the exercise of going through every supplier line by line. Uh, and I was surprised, actually, I've got an MD that runs my business uh, and has done for the last three years. But I was surprised to see how much wastage there was. But we'll certainly come out the other side of this as a much leaner uh, business. Um, so, but yeah, you know, going to all of our suppliers and renegotiating where, where we can. I was pleased, I'm pleased to say that, you know, almost all were very uh, supportive in our position. So uh, we significantly reduced uh, our, our costs there. Uh, but of course, the main cost in the recruitment business is the people. Um, and we looked at every desk on a on a case-by-case -case basis um, and made decisions around 
who we thought should be furloughed and who shouldn't. Of course, there were people that were, were willing to put their hands up. Um, so we considered those people first where we, we clearly thought there wasn't um, going to be any demand on their deaths. And then there were others that um, wanted to stay in the business, but we felt that there, it, it wasn't going to be uh, justifiable for them to do so based on the um, on what was happening in the market and, and just no job flow. So, we, you know, we didn't want people sat in the business continuing to work where it just sim simply wasn't any, any work coming in. Uh, so we did it on a case by case basis with regards to, to, to uh, consultants and who was on furlough and who wasn't. And have you started bringing people back? You mentioned, are there plans to bring everyone back in the short term? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we're going to take advantage of the uh, job retention scheme while, while it exists. Um, but yes, the positive news is we are starting to bring consultants back in. Um, so there were two consultants we brought back in last week. We also brought in our business development, one of our business development managers back in. Because I think we felt that we've cut the business as, 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 as much as we wanted to. And you know, if we continue to cut or we don't bring people back into the business, we, we won't be well placed to take advantage of, you know, the market as it returns. So uh, we're also very conscious that, uh, you know, the job retention scheme comes to an end, obviously, over the next few months. And we want to make sure that we're generating enough work as a business to be able to support bringing further people back in. Um, you, you know, that, that's, that's the strategy at the moment. And that's certainly very much the thoughts of our MD. If you cut too much, then you're not going to be able to take advantage of any, uh, any upside. Yeah, I think you're right. So we, did you follow any of your staff? Um, we've got quite a lean team already. Um, I've only got 18 consultants uh, across my business. We have furloughed three of those. Um, probably yeah, about three weeks ago and we just extended um, them as well. So uh, yes, we have three furloughed at the moment. How did, they, how did they feel about being furloughed? It's interesting, isn't it? We've got some members that have said there are people volunteering to be furloughed. We've got other members where somebody who hasn't been furloughed has complained in a formal letter that they should have been furloughed, they would have quite liked to have been furloughed. I'm telling you, there are days when I'd love to be furloughed. It's been quite busy. I how bet. Did, yeah, how have they managed those three people that you furloughed and how have you managed them? Yeah, sure. Um, very good question. We're, we're a really tight knit team and we've worked together for, for years, most of us. Um, so I think it's just a case of being totally honest and transparent. The market has changed. Um, we're, we're keeping them in the business and this is the best way um, to retain their jobs and the rest of the team's jobs for, for the future. Um, so it's just transparency, being honest. Um, we've actually topped up uh, the government scheme. So any of our staff on furlough get uh, 80% of their salary. Um, yeah. We keep constant communication with them, uh, both within my team, and obviously the HR guys as well, just to make sure that they, they know that they're supported. Um, and then naturally they're invited to any non-work events, such as quizzes and such like that we do, just to try and keep the morale up. Yeah, great. Tonya, if it's okay, may I come to you? We know there are changes about to happen with regard to the furlough scheme. What is the latest on furlough? What, what might furlough look like after August? Do you have any views on that? I think you're on mute, Tanya. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm back. Um, how many times do I have to do this to learn that? <laughs> We're all doing the same thing, don't worry. Um, what I do know is um, the Treasury issued a new Treasury direction last week which is in place until the end of June. That's the actual legislation that HMRC have to follow for um, those more legally minded out there. I, I've looked through it. There's not a huge amount of difference, but what they have done is given a lot more detail about what a non-discretionary payment looks like. So I think umbrellas now should be pretty comfortable about calculating furlough pay on on the on a variable salary rather than basic pay i would imagine so that's what i do know in terms of the new um 
scheme really the same as everyone else i read in the paper last week that there might be a contribution of 25 percent and then employ employees can work as much as they want or as much as their employer wants them to work should i say um during the furlough period which is interesting um i'm still interested we we are still sort of pushing for a different approach for agency workers um we kind of rather hopefully suggested a grant to employment agency standards last week so that employment businesses that keep agency workers on furlough could get the 25 percent back from government but i think that's wishful thinking <laughs> but you I know think that's right you don't Is suggest there been any talk about the opportunity for furlough to either switch on and switch off or part-time furlough i i think i think it i think there will but i think they might be more fle flexible about not requiring three weeks for each tranche as i said last week what i read it sounds like it might be you employees can work as much as re is required during furlough so effectively the government's paying you to for your employees to work so it might be a lot more flexible what i did read is that people might have to be in the scheme by the end of june in order to continue to use it during august but hopefully this week we might hear actually more formal news from the government yeah we're understanding that the chancellor's going to release something is it today or tomorrow i think was the plan I mean, I think other things kind of hit the press yesterday, but my understanding is... Yeah, today I mean, it was always intended, yeah, the end of May, so we'll... Uh, yeah. I think there's a lot of people waiting to hear what furlough is going to look like. I can't see if you are furloughing someone, the government, you know, pays 75% of the salary, but they can do 100% of the work. It sounds like a winner. Wouldn't we furlough all of our staff? If that were going to be and then that just means we're only paying 25 percent of any salaries because if mm. they can work and you can get 75 percent of salary then that sounds like a winner but difficult to police whether somebody's or you know working or not isn't it i mean it's going to be a bit of a nightmare okay so we will see then let then let me let me come on to some other questions if that's okay there is a view that the government are likely to relook at IR 35 in the private sector in the light of the House of Lords report, which said that the delay could be used to have a complete rethink. Um, I know that um, Davis put forward a view that IR 35 should potentially be delayed for three years rather than just the one delay. One, did we ever think that was going to come off? And two, in, if it did, and in that time frame, even in the one-year delay, do you get the impression that the Treasury and HMRC are going to have a, a whole rethink on IR35? I mean, it's legislation that's 20 years old. It was rubbish in the way it was written in the first instance. And actually, it remains not very well-written legislation. Are they likely to make big changes to it? Um... The short answer is we don't expect them to. It's, it, it passed, um, or rather it's gone to the committee stage now, the finance bill in the House of Commons with the um, date of 6th April 2021. Um, we attended the IR35 forum last week at HMRC, they're still talking about, yes, it's pushing forward, they're pushing to implement it. They want to use the extra year to give businesses even more time to prepare. So frankly, it's more of the same. Um, and they've said they are going to do a detailed post-implementation review, um, as opposed to pre-implementation review. Um, so, yeah, the word from HMRC is it's still still going ahead as planned, but we know with IR35, it's hard to predict. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah it is, isn't it? Then what's coming out of the agency standards, um, employment agency standards group that, you, you know, I know that you're having meetings twice a week with them. What's coming out? Anything new that we should know about to prepare for when we do go back? Um, they are 
try, they are working and trying to push the Home Office, as I think are a lot of um, different government departments, to more permanently change the right to work checks so that they can be done remotely um, on a more permanent basis because they're obviously being done remotely at the moment and using the third party checking you know there's a number of companies out there um, that that are able to check identification online and you know do a lot better job than someone just looking at a piece of paper in front of them um, so they're really focusing on pushing that. I think it's the Home Office who, who basically own right to work that are being the most resistant, but I know they're working on that. They're, they're looking at how to um, change their audits to being remote because um, they've got to start working again. They are, the, they are a statutory body that looks into breaches of, of the conduct regulations. They're actually looking for a few um, companies, just one or two, to test remote audits with on a totally no detriment basis, i.e. you're not gonna be hauled up for breach. So if there's any company out there that feels sufficiently comfortable about their compliance that they would be happy to have it verified by employment agency standards, then get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with employment agency standards. So they're basically looking at switching to doing audits by Microsoft Teams, um, but they want to test it before they do it in real life. Well, that um, makes it. How many tests do you reckon they'll need to do before they make a decision? How many? I, I think very them? few. I think they're just looking to do, I mean, it's they're looking to do three or four, but they still need, you know, recruitment businesses that are prepared to do that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is modern slavery. This is less a concern for our members, although, we, you know, who knows, but um, there's a big communications and awareness push. So we'll be sort of pushing out information from them over the next few months that they're, they're more concerned about modern slavery hidden in warehousing and logistics. But nonetheless, we've agreed to support them in terms of pushing that out to members, just so that you can be aware of the signs to look out for. Yeah. Um, well, you can see so many different things coming more remotely. Chris, do you think that the remote working that the consultants you've had and the rest of your team that you've had still working um, has been successful? And is it going to change the nature of the way they work for you moving forward? Uh, I think, um, I, has, do I think it's been successful? Uh, for some people, yes. For others, no. I think it depends on uh, people's personal circumstances. I think it depends on a variety of factors. Uh, do I think it will change the way of working moving forward? Yes, I do. And as a business, we've already had requests for more flexible working moving forwards. Um, and I think that uh, those requests will continue to come. And, and my position on it is very simple. If we believe that person can work just as productively from home and doesn't need to be in the office, then um, then we will we will accept those requests. Um, but yeah. And is that a from your attitude previously? Do you think, or just to continue? Um, I uh, no, we did offer. We we've already had consultants that successfully work from home, return return to work mums. You know who we might only see in the office half a day a week. Um, so it's been a model that we've been engaged, I think. Um, but I think, yes, we will become more flexible moving forward to accommodate the need. For, I'll give you an example. Um, our back office, our accounts uh, team have always worked in the office five days a week. There's a team of um, six or seven people. One of the ladies that uh, does all of our payroll of contractors has already asked, well, you know, I'm, I'm working from home effectively. I enjoy it. Um, can I have a, uh, an arrangement where that can continue moving forwards? So, um, so yeah, and as I say, uh, as long as there's no need for that person to be in the office, if they're in a manager, managerial supervisory role, then uh, I think we will be flexible to accepting uh, a lot of those requests. Yeah, so- I've shot myself in the foot now, haven't I? I've shot myself Sorry, in the foot. I said I shot yeah, myself in the foot for when they, could, when they do come in. Yeah, no you've definitely blown that now. I so have, from a methods point of view, what percentage yeah. of staff did work from home anyway, or did some working from home? And um, do you think it's so, going to change the nature of how people are working at methods? 
Yeah, very much so. So historically within my team, um, everybody worked from home, life pre-COVID, uh, one day a week. I think moving forward, the expectation will be they'll be in the office one, maybe two days max uh, a week. So I think we'll, we'll see that flip on its head. It's proven that it works uh, in terms of the communication side of things. And uh, naturally, if they need to be engaging with clients on client sites, then they can obviously uh, go and do that. Uh, but I think it will have a massive shift because um, at the end of the day, the, sort of the feedback from the guys is why, why spend sort of two, three hours commuting in uh, every day when that time can be spent um, either working uh, or, or better quality work-life balance. So um, it's something I personally support. But it's interesting then, are either of you thinking of lowering the salary rate of the staff that are working from home in a way that the public sector seem to be trying to lower a contract rate for people that are not having to travel? Um, it's something that I haven't considered until you raised it. No, um, it's not something we're looking at doing at the moment, no. Fair enough. I think it's fair enough. Okay. If we're thinking of allowing more staff to work from home, how do we think we're going to recruit new recruiters as we do start to expand, train them, and kind of make them awash with the company culture? Zoe, how's that going to work moving forward? Um, I think we can be very sensible in terms of the, um, the rest of the team and when people are going to be in the office. So we can have, once you have that degree of flexibility, if they're going to be in the office one or two days a week, we can have it structured such that there would always be somebody in the office to help support and mentor any new members of staff. I think that's very important, uh, especially more junior members of staff. Um, so... Yeah, and again, with the sort of the team's communication, everything else, I think it is a lot easier uh, now compared to, oh, helicopter overhead, sorry for the noise, um, compared to how it was many years ago. So and I think younger people coming into the business have that expectation now that they will get to, to work from home more often as well. So we need to be conscious of that. Yeah, I've got a question here, actually, that's coming on the working from home scenario. What about the impact on the remaining team if your top billers all want to work from home? How might that work? I mean, it's going to become a juggle, this, isn't it? Whom we allow, whom we don't allow, how much time we do allow, how much time we'd rather than being there, making sure there's a bit of competition on the go and team working. Chris, what are you going to do with regard to that? If your top billers said, mate, I want to work from home five days a week, why shouldn't I? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's not one that I can give you a very specific answer on, and because we, we, we haven't gone into that much detail about that planning. But what I can say is that my expectation is that the, the, the most senior people, whether they're, well, of course, managerial, they'll be in the office to support their teams. But top billers, I will want to see present in the office so other people can learn from them. Uh, you know, whether that's on a, on a scheduled basis. So we've always got you know, some of our top, top performers in the office each day of the week. But um, losing that person from the office environment, you know, where we're a company that employs lots of trainees, I think would be, uh, would be a big loss and something we'd want to avoid. Yeah. Um, Tanya, will there be problems if we're picking and choosing who can and who can't work from home certain days? Are we going to get sort of sued for treating people differently? Well, I think the point is um, you just have to follow the flexible working rules. I mean, I think historically businesses have been a bit more restrictive about just saying, oh, no, this doesn't fit in with our business needs you know we can't run our business if you're working from home so I'm going to say no to your flexible working request um, now I suppose that if, if that if that's if that goalpost has moved then you have got to be more conscious of um, of assessing it objectively what I think would be a great great shame is if in two years time what's actually happened is there's loads of women working from home because of childcare, and 
there's loads of men back in the office as normal because I think that will then mean there's an imbalance, frankly. I'm much more in favour of actually if it is going to shift to more working from home, well, let the men, you know, yeah, men, start working from home. <laughs> it's not going to affect your career. And then you can do more childcare, but I think it will also create a more overall balanced working environment because I think that is... If we don't think about this sort of thing, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be the women working flexibly from home and the men over time will probably shift back to what they've always done. That's my, that slightly my personal view. And that might well be detrimental to the career prospects of those women that have been pushed in that situation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think so. working from home and looking after kids are two separate jobs, actually. And I think that it can be very dangerous for anybody who wants to be working home with a view that they're looking after, especially small kids simultaneously. Yeah, but if, if you've got children that are sort of 12, 13, there is a, you know, it's a nice thing to be at home when they're doing their homework, isn't it? You know, so it's not just about looking after children that are demanding your attention all the time. It's, you know, about just being there, I suppose, partly. But yeah, I agree with you. It, they are too very different things. <laughs> expectation set actually Zoe let me come to you do you think that the expectation set of recruitment consultants or back office staff in our businesses will start be really quite heavily focused on how many days am I going to be able to work from home and that that will be detrimental to having Quora in an office especially for smaller businesses um yes I think there will be that expectation uh moving forward because it's proven it can work um, but yes obviously culturally uh, going back to what I was saying originally I would like to have my team all together uh, at least one day in the office I, I do think um, having that camaraderie and that, and that banter and, and knowledge share uh, is, is super important but I don't think there's a necessity to do that every single day yeah and Tanya can I ask you one question on this uh, one more question on it so if you give the opportunity for somebody to work three or four days at home and one day in the office, what if you feel it isn't working? Can you say, sorry, matey, you need to be back five days after all? I think you do need to be careful about this because it can be a permanent change to the contract of employment. So I think what most people tend to do is they will agree something for an initial period of, say, three months, six months, and then they will review it. And then if it's working, then it might switch to being a permanent change to employment. That's so I would say it's very much recommend that you test it out first. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a dilemma, isn't there? There's a flavor for this. If you don't do it properly, giving you a get out of jail clause, if it doesn't work. Look, we, we've got people at Absco, some of whom work from home more than others. We've had people that work from home and what they really meant was they were doing nothing at home. And, you know, when you find out you need to sort of performance manage somebody to find out what on earth was working from home when you didn't make any calls and you didn't send any emails. I mean, you know, um, but you do have to monitor that kind of scenario as well. And it needs to work properly for everybody, I think. And there is a dilemma with the culture of a business. And if you do take on junior people, how's that going to work? How does that osmosis happen with regard to skill sets and how to be good and and whatever as well as normal training how does that osmosis of sitting next to a good person you know happen and and give the skill sets to a more junior person it, it is definitely quite different let me come to some more questions um if i come to you zoe do Method use its consultancy arm for anything that's outside of ir35 consultancy contracts um, yes, again, by the very nature of, of the work that we're doing, um, most of it is all fixed term, term deliverables. Um, so, yes, we do. And do you think that's the, the nature of the future of the contract market moving more toward that kind of delivery? Very much so. I mean, for me, it's about actually delivering tangible value to the clients um, and by sort of your, your fixed term deliverables and milestones um, you, you are inevitably doing that so yes I do. Chris do you do any work in that kind of arena um, or yeah, we do. What kind of projects? Yeah we're doing more uh, of that type of work um, uh, 
Uh, our field engineering projects uh, business is is based. A lot of that is based on um, is based on uh, deliverables. Um, so under SOW. Um, so yeah, we're accustomed to working in that way. Le less so in the public sector, actually. But I do feel that's the future for us. Yeah. Tanya, legally, do you think that's the future of contract work? Yes, I certainly see an increase in it. What and and actually possibly once I are 35 if and when it comes in once it beds down then I don't think there's going to be an immediate switch to I know lots of people thought of consultancy before the go live but actually I think a lot of people are going to take time to do it properly so it'll be gradual over years but I do think I agree I think that is a significant part of the future for contracting yeah, yeah, I suspect so too. Um, do either of your businesses work through RPOs, MSPs, or get involved in the outsource market at all? Nope. Zoe, not Chris. Uh, no, we try to avoid that where where possible. And have either of you ever thought of setting up your own outsource solution? No. <laughs> okay, Chris. Uh, we, we do some on-site um, sort of uh, managed services to, to some of our accounts, but no, going down a, that the fully sort of RPO route is not something that's on our agenda at the moment. Because we have seen a huge growth in that. You know, it's over a third of UK um, placements come with uh, an outsourced business somewhere in the middle of them. So it's um, a big and getting larger percentage of the market. Um, and then, of course, grown very heavily throughout Europe and, you know, spreading even further than that. So I just wondered if in the future it's something neither of you have, have contemplated by way of growth. No. No. Answer. Um, no, no, we haven't. But obviously never, never say never. Um, I, I personally rather have sort of the one-on-one the -on -one interaction uh, in terms of getting the, the, the quality and understanding the, the, the department and the client uh, and the projects and programs as well. I, I think to an extent you do lose that uh, in an RPO uh, scenario. Um, but yes, it'd be interesting to see how the, uh, the recruitment market evolves over, over the coming years. Yeah. Um, let me come back to this working from home scenario. So research that we've just done and has been published, some of it in The Telegraph, was saying that about a third of recruitment companies are looking to downsize their premises and over half have cancelled expansion of premises plans. So getting a bigger, certainly getting a more expensive premises seems to be totally um, off the agenda and definitely looking at the view if you're going to have people working from home do you need expensive offices we all know as Chris mentioned earlier on the biggest um, expenditure the biggest expense for running a recruitment company is staff and often closely second uh, are office spaces Zoe you are in six different serious locations realistically what have you thought about with regard to either expanding or downsizing office space? Yeah, um, well, our, our main head office is is in Farringdon in, in London, uh, and we only actually moved in there. Um, we had, have got a fantastic two two floors that we had totally refurbished. Uh, we only moved in in November last year, obviously on, on an initial five-year lease. So uh, I think we're a little bit tied in uh, for, for the foreseeable. But again, obviously, there's different things you can do. You can they look at subletting uh, out certain parts of your office space with partners and the such like, and we'll possibly look at doing that moving forward. Um, but yes, we do have very beautiful, shiny offices. <laughs> Bad timing, perhaps. The way it goes, is it? What about the other offices across? Um, I mean, if you look at yes. Cardiff, Edinburgh, Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield. They yeah, are places to have offices are there yeah, no, absolutely. We've only just opened, uh, literally beginning of the year, our office up in Scotland. Uh, each of our, our sort of satellite offices, as we call them, uh, are, are relatively small uh, in, in comparison to obviously our, our main HQ. So I think it's something we'll monitor moving forward, but for the time being, we have no, no plans to, to change that at all. Okay, Chris, what about you? Expansion from an office, office point of view? or actually looking at cutting costs from an office point of view? 
Uh, yeah, well, like Zoe, we just put a lot of money into our head office uh, in terms of refurb and taking our sales floor capacity up to 65 desks, uh, which you could argue was bad timing. Um, but I do think actually that by having more desks, that will help us with social distancing and getting people back into the office. Um, so uh, in terms of our head office, I, I think that we've done, we've, we've spent the money there. We, we've got capacity to, to grow. The satellite office we have in Milton Keynes is, is something we're looking at um, in terms of the, the, the current supplier. Uh, I won't mention names, but we, we, we did briefly earlier, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think they've been very inflexible. They're a big service office provider. They've been very inflexible with us. Um, and I want to work with suppliers moving forward that will show us flexibility uh, in times of crisis, not, uh, not the other way. So uh, do we have plans to extend our satellite offices? No, it, it was partly on the agenda pre-COVID, uh, post-COVID. Uh, I think that will become further down the agenda, if that makes sense. Let me ask you a question, which might be slightly ouchy, Chris, so bear with me. Okay. Talk to me still after this, but um, are you being flexible with your customers on rates and fees at the moment? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, we, we have to our, some of our larger customers offered them uh, longer payment terms. We haven't gone as far as offering um, reduced margins. Um, but as I said earlier in the call, we, we haven't been asked either. So, but yeah, I think we've wanted to demonstrate flexibility to some of our bigger customers that we know have had some of their own challenges. For example, a big customer of ours is a software business to the hospitality sector. They obviously have, 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 have been struggling. So we've offered them flexibility with regards to, uh, to payments. And that has been well received. Yeah, but it's quite difficult, isn't it? A number of APSCO members have contacted us to try and negotiate en masse, um, not actually with office providers. And I, th I think the one that's created your service office is not the funkiest of the, or the newest of the up and coming bunch. It's more of a traditional uh, yeah. service provider from an office point of view. But people are looking for us to negotiate en masse, which we can't do. A dangerous place for APSCO to be, and dangerous for our members who want us to do it. You haven't asked, by the way. Um, but it's difficult, isn't it? Because everybody's having problems all the way along with regard to cash flow, with regard to payment of bills. And I just wonder, you know, whether, whether we should expect, and I'm asking the question rather than suggesting the answer, whether we should expect um, office providers to give us discounts or terms or whatever. Certainly, should they give us discounts, they could, could they help us out on the terms. If, if some of us are not prepared to do that with our client base, quite a difficult one. Because some of the job boards or social media uh, scenarios have played a bit of hardball. And it's quite difficult if we're playing hardball and they're playing hardball, or if we're you know, providing openness to our customers, then I suppose we've got more of an expectation that it goes all the way along the food chain. I just wonder whether that's happening out there. What do you think? Do you think you're quite rare in being generous in helping out your larger end user clients? I, I don't know the answer to, to, to that, Anne. I think, uh, I think yes. I, I th I said I don't know the answer. Other owners, recruitment business owners I've spoken to have offered flexibility in terms, uh, payment terms. I'm not aware of companies offering flexibility in, in actual margins. I have heard on other uh, calls of customers actually asking for discounts on work that's already completed. I don't think that I don't think that's reasonable at all. No. Um, but, you, you know, I, I think all of these things have to be taken on a case by case basis, don't they? And I think there's companies out there asking for discounts where, you know, they, they have a very strong cash position. They have a very strong balance sheet uh, and maybe don't need that support. Where are there, there are others that, that clearly do? So, um, yeah, but, 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 you know. 
Yeah, I think in the first couple of weeks of lockdown, any business, recruitment company or our customer base, did exactly what you did uh, going through. And sometimes they got their FD that didn't know whether they wanted services and cut costs. And it was, I think, the business equivalent of buying loads of toilet rolls, of having your spare room, you know, filled up with toilet rolls and hand wash and flour. I don't know what ever happened to flour, but there's never any when I go shopping. Anyway, um, I'm filling these rooms with a whole load of stuff. And I think a lot of things got cut. And actually, for people that looked to them in more detail, found that all of us were spending a little bit too much money and some you know, things that we shouldn't have been spending money on and whatever. But people put lines through a whole load of stuff without querying it. Often it was the FD, as I said, who wasn't involved in getting any value from it. And, and that panic stations has calmed down, I think, now for most businesses. I mean, if, if one's financial state is more dire, then you can see how you can't afford to calm down from that. But I do wonder if everybody's doing the same thing and whether, yeah, whether we realise that supplies out there that supply to us need a bit of leeway in the same way as the people that we, you know, that we are supplying to and whether it goes along the chain. So have you had any experience of that kind of requests or, or even demands along that kind of supply chain? No, none at all. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but that's, yeah, but that's good. Well, that's a good thing, except, as you said, with the public sector, putting in more requests for... Absolutely, yes, for um, discounted rates for, for home working. That, that's the only instance I can actually think of. Yeah, OK. Because there still is that kind of chain out there. Um, Chris, you mentioned about perhaps now having a bit more space than you might need has been quite good for when you do get the team back for that um, distancing, social distancing. Do you have a plan in place for when you're thinking of getting your team back into the office? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that uh, I'm looking at the moment with our HR manager. Uh, the starting point of that, um, which came off the back of that very useful uh, webinar that we did with your legal partners last week, was it last week or the week before, about sending out a questionnaire to all of our staff that went out last week. Uh, and the primary objective of that was to gauge people's interest in well, who wants to come back to work, who is, uh, sorry, to the office, who is happy to um, stay working from home. Um, so we're going to we're going to collate the responses for that over the next uh, few days. Um, in terms of actually opening the office up, so we, we've debated this. Um, of course, the guidelines are clear, aren't they? If a, if people can work from home, they should continue working from home. And uh, all of the people in our business can, I think, it's fair to say, that are not furloughed, they can continue to work from home. However. We have people that want to return back to the office uh, and feel they would be more productive back in the office environment. So the question then becomes, well, do you deny those people the opportunity to come back or do you open up the office for those? Uh, and it might be only, I don't know, 10, 15 people that want to come back to the office. Uh, do, do you do that? And I think we've decided that uh, we do want to, we don't want to deny people the opportunity to come back to, a, to an office environment. Um, so uh, I'd like to think that we will um, we'll open the office up uh, to those people at some point mid next month. Um, but there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that need to happen before then. Of course, we need to make sure we're following the government guidelines. Um, but I've spoke to a number of, actually, this might be useful feedback for some of your members. I've spoke to a number of owners of recruitment businesses in Birmingham, uh, independent companies who are planning to open up mid-June, 15th of June. Uh, one company mentioned to me the 8th of June. So, so people have those plans, um, certainly, to, to, to start opening their offices back up. Yeah, look, we've, we've had experience of our members in these kind of discussions where people just don't know and would like a view of what everybody else is doing. Because 8th of June sounds pretty early to me, yeah. even 15th of June sounds early. And I think people just don't know what to plan and what is good practice and what's appropriate. And people are going to have to, you know, get a flavour. And even some boards where there's... 
a lack of agreement across a board with somebody being bullish and wanting to get back the day after tomorrow and somebody wanting to not open till September, October. So what are you doing? Have you made plans for methods and how to get people back and when to get people back? Um, we haven't got any plans as yet. Um, we have our, our board meeting actually tomorrow uh, and that's certainly one of the topics for discussion. Um, my, my gut feel at the moment, because obviously a lot of people do travel in uh, to our, our sort of central London offices, um, I, I can't see them going back until J July, August at the very, very earliest. Yeah, I think one of the things that all of us need to remember is if, if your office is somewhere where your staff will need to get crowded, dangerous, buggy public transport to get there, then however safe your office is, once they do get there, they're endangering themselves en route. Absolutely. And I think the easiest thing, so Absco have, you know, two offices, well, actually Anna focus in the business as well. Our London office is, is in, in a hub, I mean, it's in London Bridge and right by the station. I think it's gonna be very hard for our staff to go back there because of public transport in central London. Whereas if I look at our, our office in Cheshire and Frodsham and the setup in the Midlands, that's got to be easier because of car journeys and not mixing and mingling without the social distancing available really, um, that it makes it much more dangerous. So I suspect those are gonna get back to our offices later. But it's a concern, isn't it? Don't want to be too late. Don't want to be too early. Don't want to have anyone's uh, lack of health afterwards in, you know, within the, your own power and to feel guilty about it, really. So it's a dangerous time frame and one for big decisions. Um, have either of you been concerned about data security whilst you've had people working from home and are looking at having more home workers? And if so, have you done anything from a, a security point of view with regard to data? There's a lot of scamming going out there. Chris? Uh, yeah, it was one that um, we, we discussed initially. Uh, and I think the question was, do we allow people to use their own devices, their own laptops uh, to dial in? Um, we took the, uh, the approach that no, it needed to be a company device. Uh, which then gave us the headache of, I think only about 60% of our, our consultants had laptops. So we had to go out and buy a load of, of laptops as many others did. Um, so we, we followed the advice of our, uh, our IT people really. And um, yeah, so it's, it's own devices. We, we, I think we've upgraded uh, some of our email security um, recently. Um, two-factor authentication, or all of that good stuff that the cybersecurity people talk to you about. So yeah, we've spent more money in that, in that area. In terms of the, the specifics, I can't, I can't give you all the detail, Anne. No, it doesn't matter. Zoe, has Methods spent more money? I mean, I think it's a time when you need to spend more money, actually, on making sure that the environment, which is a different environment, isn't it? It's spread all over the place, different people with different systems. Are you spending more money on making sure that Methods is secure as a business? I think because we already have the, the list X status, um, all, all our systems in terms of enabling people to work from home, we're, we're very, very secure anyway. So I don't think, as far as I'm aware, um, we've had to do any additional um, security to that, which we already had previously. Okay, good. Then let me come on to a slightly different subject as we come toward the end point of this. But again, looking forward, Tanya, we've pretty much been able to forget Brexit. I mean, it's hardly been m mentioned, especially when you've got government advisors on a jolly with their wife on their birthday. We seem to have forgotten the bigger issues uh, like Brexit. Do you think Brexit is heading in the right direction? Is it going to happen? And is it going to happen in a tidy way? Do you have a view? Well, Brexit has happened, hasn't it? We're, we're, you know, we're outside the EU. So, so really it's, well, is there going to be any sort of agreement about anything before December or not? I think what this government does is takes it to the wire. So expect it to be taken to the wire. But I mean, I think generally most people think it's inconceivable that there'll be an all encompassing trade agreement by the end of the year. So Pro, you know, they might get home on an agreement for goods, I suspect. But, you know, that's just my personal view. 
but they'll take it to the that's going to be detrimental to the recruitment market where a number of our members have international offices and place cross-border i would imagine most members i would hope because you know we started doing our no deal updates about two years ago if not three um we'll have just bitten that bullet if if they're doing work overseas then they they are going to be a third company they're going to have no priority no rights so you know i would hope and imagine that they have now got themselves sorted with lawyers in country and um and are prepared to be as i say third third countries uh, third companies third party companies so to speak and yeah. those with offices in the country again i'm sure they've taken the advice of local lawyers about whether they need local directors or this kind of thing um, one other thing to think about is under the data gdpr you'll need some sort if if there isn't an agreement on data you will need um an appointed contact in Europe if you do business in Europe, if you don't have offices in Europe, somebody like a lawyer or somebody to be your representative in yeah. the EU. Yeah. There's a lot of um, things like that. Have either of our panel members, Chris and Zoe, had plans to expand into Europe or anywhere further afield? Because I know you're very UK based at, uh, based at the moment. Zoe, what are the plans to move outside and beyond the UK? And would Brexit are a bad deal at the end of the year kind of curtail those plans? Yeah, no, as, as it stands at the moment, we have no plans to, uh, to expand outside. We're very happy uh, being UK centric. Um, but again, ne never say never. Um, and it'd, say, it'd be interesting to see how the landscape changes uh, over the next couple of years. So I think it's just a case of, uh, of watching this space and, and see how, uh, how things evolve. Yeah, Chris, have you planned for a recession in the UK? And made plan you know, plans to come out of that somewhere else or plans to stay in it and ride a recession? Or no recession, what, what do you think? Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's part of our ongoing discussions at the moment, you know, do we look in moving into new markets or do we try and find growth of the markets that we're in? I, th I think initially where we feel there's growth, it's, it's obviously uh, easier to find growth in a sector that you're already in. But we are also looking at uh, where we need to be, um, you know, as we all come out of this. But we're, we're planning for um, a very slow return um, to, uh, you know, what, what was before normal business levels. I think that, um, yeah, I think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be a quick bounce back across most of our sectors. I think it's going to be slow. Uh, we're 99% UK. We were looking at uh, Europe. We were looking at the US before this. Um, that all needs to be uh, reprioritized, I think. Um, so a bit of a batten down the hatches. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, we've got to get the UK business fixed before I think we start looking at uh, moving uh, outside of the UK, is my view. Okay, that makes sense. Why don't I just bring this now to a close and say thank you very, very much to Zoe Lewis from Methods and to Chris Short from Concept Resor uh, Resourcing. Thank you for them being both so open about what's going on within their businesses. These are real people running real recruitment companies in real markets in real time, I suppose you could say. Um, and these are the problems that a number of our members have got and the different ways of dealing with them, I think is useful and interesting so that we can in, you know, it's been said a million times, unprecedented times, but it really is that people can make up their minds based on what other people are doing and timeframes they're looking at in order to make better decisions. Can I also thank Tanya Bowers, who is Absco's legal counsel for giving us a clear view of what's going on. I know that the minute we hear from Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor with regard to changes from a furlough point of view or indeed any of the other changes that will affect our members, we will get that information out instantly to the members and in detail to make sure that you know what's going on. There's a full schedule of events this week and every week. We're rescheduling some of the events because we kind of forgot it's Whitson holiday and that some people might not be working. It all merged into one. So we might change some of the um, sessions that we have this week into being next week to make sure that 
you our members do not miss some things that we think you cannot afford to miss but there's still a full schedule and another full schedule next week i want to thank you i want to tell all of our members and indeed anyone in the recruitment market and beyond stay safe I suppose I should say stay alert. Preferably don't go on jollies on your husband or wife's birthday and get caught and then need to lie about it later on with the national press. Stay safe. Thank you for joining us and speak to you again next Tuesday. Thank you, panel members. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.